LibriVox.org. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo. Book 22, Chapter 10. Here, perhaps, our adversaries will say that their gods also have done some wonderful things if now they begin to compare their gods to our dead men. Or will they also say that they have gods taken from among dead men, such as Hercules, Romulus, and many others, whom they fancy to have been received into the number of the gods? But our martyrs are not our gods, for we know that the martyrs and we have both but one God, and that the same. Nor yet are the miracles which they maintain to have been done by means of their temples at all comparable to those which are done by the tombs of our martyrs. If they seem similar, their gods have been defeated by our martyrs as Pharaoh's magi were by Moses. In reality the demons wrought these marvels with the same impure pride with which they aspired to be the gods of the nations. But the martyrs do these wonders, or rather God does them, while they pray and assist, in order that an impulse may be given to the faith by which we believe that they are not our gods, but have, together with ourselves, one God." In fine, they built temples to these gods of theirs, and set up altars, and ordained priests, and appointed sacrifices. But to our martyrs we build, not temples as if they were gods, but monuments as to dead men whose spirits live with God. Neither do we erect altars at these monuments, that we may sacrifice to the martyrs, but to the one God of the martyrs and of ourselves. And in this sacrifice they are named in their own place and rank as men of God who conquered the world by confessing him, but they are not invoked by the sacrificing priest. For it is to God, not to them, he sacrifices, though he sacrifices at their monument, for he is God's priest, not theirs. The sacrifice itself, too, is the body of Christ, which is not offered to them, because they themselves are this body. Which, then, can more readily be believed to work miracles? They who wish themselves to be reckoned gods by those on whom they work miracles, or those whose sole object in working any miracle is to induce faith in God, and in Christ also, as God? They who wished to turn even their crimes into sacred rites, or those who are unwilling that even their own praises be consecrated, and seek that everything for which they are justly praised be ascribed to the glory of him in whom they are praised. For in the Lord their souls are praised. Let us therefore believe those who both speak the truth and work wonders. For by speaking the truth they suffered, and so won the power of working wonders. And the leading truth they professed is that Christ rose from the dead, and first showed in his own flesh the immortality of the resurrection which he promised should be ours, either in the beginning of the world to come, or in the end of this world. Chapter 11 but against this great gift of God, these reasoners, whose thoughts the Lord knows that they are vain, bring arguments from the weights of the elements, for they have been taught by their master Plato that the two greatest elements of the world, and the furthest removed from one another, are coupled and united by the two intermediate, air and water. And consequently they say, since the earth is the first of the elements, beginning from the base of the series, the second the water above the earth, the third the air above the water, the fourth the heaven above the air, it follows that a body of earth cannot live in the heaven, for each element is poised by its own weight so as to preserve its own place and rank. Behold with what arguments human infirmity, possessed with vanity, contradicts the omnipotence of God. What, then, do so many earthly bodies do in the air, since the air is the third element from the earth? 
unless perhaps he who has granted to the earthly bodies of birds that they be carried through the air by the lightness of feathers and wings has not been able to confer upon the bodies of men made immortal the power to abide in the highest heaven the earthly animals too which cannot fly among which are men ought on these terms to live under the earth as fishes which are the animals of the water live under the water why then can an animal of earth not live in the second element that is in water while it can in the third why though it belongs to the earth is it forthwith suffocated if it is forced to live in the second element next above earth while it lives in the third and cannot live out of it is there a mistake here in the order of the elements or is not the mistake rather in their reasonings and not in the nature of things i will not repeat what i said in the thirteenth book that many earthly bodies though heavy like lead receive from the workman's hand a form which enables them to swim in water and yet it is denied that the omnipotent worker can confer on the human body a property which shall enable it to pass into heaven and dwell there but against what i have formerly said they can find nothing to say even though they introduce and make the most of this order of the elements in which they confide for if the order be that the earth is first the water second the air third the heaven fourth then the soul is above all for aristotle said that the soul was a fifth body while plato denied that it was a body at all if it were a fifth body then certainly it would be above the rest and if it is not a body at all so much the more does it rise above all what then does it do in an earthly body what does this soul which is finer than all else do in such a mass of matter as this what does the lightest of substances do in this ponderosity this swiftest substance in such sluggishness will not the body be raised to heaven by virtue of so excellent a nature as this and if now earthly bodies can retain the souls below shall not the souls be one day able to raise the earthly bodies above if we pass now to their miracles which they oppose to our martyrs as wrought by their gods shall not even these be found to make for us and to help out our argument for if any of the miracles of their gods are great certainly that is a great one which varro mentions of a vestal virgin who when she was endangered by a false accusation of unchastity filled a sieve with water from the tiber and carried it to her judges without any part of it leaking who kept the weight of water in the sieve who prevented any drop from falling from it through so many open holes they will answer some god or some demon if a god is he greater than the god who made the world if a demon is he a mightier than an angel who serves the god by whom the world was made if then a lesser god angel or demon could so sustain the weight of this liquid element that the water might seem to have changed its nature shall not almighty god who himself created all the elements be able to eliminate from the earthly body its heaviness so that the quickened body shall dwell in whatever element the quickening spirit pleases then again since they give the air a middle place between the fire above and the water beneath how is it that we often find it between water and water and between the water and the earth for what do they make of those watery clouds between which and the seas air is constantly found intervening i should like to know by what weight and order of the elements it comes to pass that very violent and stormy torrents are suspended in the clouds above the earth before they rush along upon the earth under the air 
In fine, why is it that throughout the whole globe the air is between the highest heaven and the earth, if its place is between the sky and the water, as the place of the water is between the sky and the earth? Finally, if the order of the elements is so disposed that, as Plato thinks, the two extremes, fire and earth, are united by the two means, air and water, and that the fire occupies the highest part of the sky, and the earth the lowest part, or, as it were, the foundation of the world, and that therefore earth cannot be in the heavens, how is fire in the earth? For according to this reasoning, these two elements, earth and fire, ought to be so restricted to their own places, the highest and the lowest, that neither the lowest can rise to the place of the highest, nor the highest sink to that of the lowest. Thus, as they think that no particle of earth is or shall ever be in the sky, so we ought to see no particle of fire on the earth. But the fact is, that it exists to such an extent, not only on, but even under the earth, that the tops of mountains vomit it forth. Besides, that we see it to exist on earth for human uses, and even to be produced from the earth, since it is kindled from wood and stones, which are without doubt earthly bodies. But that upper fire, they say, is tranquil, pure, harmless, eternal. But this earthly fire is turbid, smoky, corruptible, and corrupting. But it does not corrupt the mountains and caverns of the earth, in which it rages continually. But grant that the earthly fire is so unlike the other as to suit its earthly position, why then do they object to our believing that the nature of earthly bodies shall some day be made incorruptible and fit for the sky, even as now fire is corruptible and suited to the earth. They therefore adduce from their weights and order of the elements nothing from which they can prove that it is impossible for Almighty God to make our bodies such that they can dwell in the skies. Chapter 12 but their way is to feign a scrupulous anxiety in investigating this question, and to cast ridicule on our faith in the resurrection of the body by asking whether abortions shall rise. And, as the Lord says, Verily I say unto you, Not a hair of your head shall perish. Shall all bodies have an equal stature and strength, or shall there be differences in size? For if there is to be equality, where shall those abortions, supposing that they rise again, get that bulk which they had not here? Or, if they shall not rise, because they were not born, but cast out, they raise the same question about children who have died in childhood, asking us whence they get the stature which we see they had not here. For we will not say that those who haven't been not only born, but born again, shall not rise again. Then further they ask of what size these equal bodies shall be. For if all shall be as tall and large as were the tallest and largest in this world, they ask us how it is that not only children, but many full-grown persons, shall receive what they here did not possess, if each one is to receive what he had here. And if the saying of the Apostle, that we are all to come to the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ, or that other saying, whom he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, is to be understood to mean that the stature and size of Christ's body shall be the measure of the bodies of all those who shall be in his kingdom, then, say they, the size and height of many must be diminished, and if so much of the bodily frame itself be lost, what becomes of the saying, Not a hair of your head shall perish? Besides, it might be asked regarding the hair itself whether all that the barber has cut off shall be restored. And if it is to be restored, who would not shrink from such deformity? 
for as the same restoration will be made of what has been pared off the nails, much will be replaced on the body which a regard for its appearance had cut off. And where, then, will be its beauty, which assuredly ought to be much greater in that immortal condition than it could be in this corruptible state? On the other hand, if such things are not restored to the body, they must perish. How, then, they say, shall not a hair of the head perish? In like manner they reason about fatness and leanness, for if all are to be equal, then certainly there shall not be some fat, others lean. Some, therefore, shall gain, others lose something. Consequently, there will not be a simple restoration of what formerly existed, but, on the one hand, an addition of what had no existence, and, on the other, a loss of what did before exist. The difficulties, too, about the corruption and dissolution of dead bodies, that one is turned into dust while another evaporates into the air, that some are devoured by beasts, some by fire, while some perish by shipwreck or by drowning in one shape or other, so that their bodies decay into liquid. These difficulties give them immoderate alarm, and they believe that all those dissolved elements cannot be gathered again and reconstructed into a body. They also make eager use of all the deformities and blemishes which either accident or birth has produced, and accordingly, with horror and derision, cite monstrous births, and ask if every deformity will be preserved in the resurrection. For if we say that no such thing shall be reproduced in the body of a man, they suppose that they confute us by citing the marks of the wounds which we assert were found in the risen body of the Lord Christ. But of all these the most difficult question is, into whose body that flesh shall return, which has been eaten and assimilated by another man constrained by hunger to use it so, for it has been converted into the flesh of the man who used it as his nutriment, and it filled up those losses of flesh which famine had produced. For the sake, then, of ridiculing the resurrection, they ask, Shall this return to the man whose flesh it first was, or to him whose flesh it afterwards became? And thus, too, they seek to give promise to the human soul of alternations of true misery and false happiness, in accordance with Plato's theory, or, in accordance with Porphyry's, that, after many transmigrations into different bodies, it ends its miseries and never more returns to them, not, however, by obtaining an immortal body, but by escaping from every kind of body. CHAPTER Thirteen. To these objections, then, of our adversaries, which I have thus detailed, I will now reply, trusting that God will mercifully assist my endeavors. That abortions, which, even supposing they were alive in the womb, did also die there, shall rise again, I make bold neither to affirm nor to deny, although I fail to see why, if they are not excluded from the number of the dead, they should not attain to the resurrection of the dead. For either all the dead shall not rise, and there will be to all eternity some souls without bodies, though they once had them, only in their mother's womb indeed, or if all human souls shall receive again the bodies which they had wherever they lived, and which they left when they died, then I do not see how I can say that even those who died in their mother's womb shall have no resurrection. But whichever of these opinions any one may adopt concerning them, we must at least apply to them, if they rise again, all that we have to say of infants who have been born. CHAPTER Fourteen. What then are we to say of infants, if not that they will not rise in that diminutive body in which they died, but shall receive by the marvellous and rapid operation of God that body which time, by a slower process, would have given them? For in the Lord's words, where he says, Not a hair of your head shall perish, it is asserted that nothing which was possessed shall be wanting. 
but it is not said that nothing which was not possessed shall be given. To the dead infant there was wanting the perfect stature of its body, for even the perfect infant lacks the perfection of bodily size, being capable of further growth. This perfect stature is, in a sense, so possessed by all that they are conceived and born with it, that is, they have it potentially, though not yet in actual bulk, just as all the members of the body are potentially in the seed, though even after the child is born, some of them, the teeth, for example, may be wanting. In this seminal principle of every substance there seems to be, as it were, the beginning of everything which does not yet exist, or rather does not appear, but which in process of time will come into being, or rather into sight. In this, therefore, the child who is to be tall or short is already tall or short. And in the resurrection of the body we need, for the same reason, fear no bodily loss. For though all should be of equal size, and reach gigantic proportions, lest the men who were largest here should lose anything of their bulk, and it should perish, in contradiction to the words of Christ, who said that not a hair of their head should perish, yet why should there lack the means by which that wonderful worker should make such additions, seeing that he is the Creator, who himself created all things out of nothing? Chapter 15 It is certain that Christ rose in the same bodily stature in which he died, and that it is wrong to say that when the general resurrection shall have arrived, his body shall, for the sake of equaling the tallest, assume proportions which it had not when he appeared to the disciples in the figure with which they were familiar. But if we say that even the bodies of taller men are to be reduced to the size of the Lord's body, there will be a great loss in many bodies, though he promised that not a hair of their head should perish. It remains, therefore, that we conclude that every man shall receive his own size which he had in youth, though he died an old man, or which he would have had, supposing he died before his prime. As for what the Apostle said of the measure of the age or the fullness of Christ, we must either understand him to refer to something else, to wit, the fact that the measure of Christ will be completed when all the members among the Christian communities are added to the head, or, if we are to refer it to the resurrection of the body, the meaning is that all shall rise neither beyond nor under youth, but in that vigor and age to which we know that Christ had arrived. For even the world's wisest men have fixed the bloom of youth at about the age of thirty, and when this period has been passed, the man begins to decline towards the defective and duller period of old age. And therefore the apostle did not speak of the measure of the body, nor of the measure of the stature, but of the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ. Chapter 16 Then again these words, predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son of God, may be understood of the inner man. So in another place he says to us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed in the renewing of your mind. In so far, then, as we are transformed so as not to be conformed to the world, we are conformed to the Son of God. It may also be understood thus, that as he was conformed to us by assuming mortality, we shall be conformed to him by immortality, and this indeed is connected with the resurrection of the body. But if we are also taught in these words what form our bodies shall rise in, as the measure we spoke of before, so also this conformity is to be understood not of size, but of age. Accordingly all shall rise in the stature they either had attained or would have attained, had they lived to their prime, 
although it will be no great disadvantage, even if the form of the body be infantine or aged, while no infirmity shall remain in the mind, nor in the body itself. So that even if any one contends that every person will rise again in the same bodily form in which he died, we need not spend much labor in disputing with him. CHAPTER Seventeen. From the words, Till we all come to a perfect man, to the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ, and from the words, Conformed to the image of the Son of God, some conclude that women shall not rise women, but that all shall be men, because God made man only of earth, and woman of the man. For my part, they seem to be wiser, who make no doubt that both sexes shall rise. For there shall be no lust, which is now the cause of confusion. For before they sinned, the man and the woman were naked, and were not ashamed. From those bodies, then, vice shall be withdrawn, while nature shall be preserved. And the sex of woman is not a vice, but nature. It shall then indeed be superior to carnal intercourse and childbearing. Nevertheless, the female members shall remain adapted not to the old uses, but to a new beauty, which, so far from provoking lust, now extinct, shall excite praise to the wisdom and clemency of God, who both made what was not, and delivered from corruption what he made." For at the beginning of the human race the woman was made of a rib taken from the side of the man while he slept. For it seemed fit that even then Christ and his church should be foreshadowed in this event. For that sleep of the man was the death of Christ, whose side, as he hung lifeless upon the cross, was pierced with a spear, and there flowed from it blood and water, and these we know to be the sacraments by which the church is built up. For Scripture used this very word, not saying he formed or framed, but built her up into a woman, whence also the apostle speaks of the edification of the body of Christ, which is the church. The woman, therefore, is a creature of God, even as the man. But by her creation from man, unity is commended, and the manner of her creation prefigured, as has been said, Christ and the church. He, then, who created both sexes, will restore both. Jesus himself also, when asked by the Sadducees, who denied the resurrection, which of the seven brothers should have to wife the woman, whom all in succession had taken to raise up seed to their brother, as the law enjoined, says, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And though it was a fit opportunity for his saying, She about whom you make inquiries shall herself be a man, and not a woman, he said nothing of the kind. But in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. They shall be equal to the angels in immortality and happiness, not in flesh, nor in resurrection, which the angels did not need, because they could not die. The Lord then denied that there would be in the resurrection not women, but marriages, and he uttered this denial in circumstances in which the question mooted would have been more easily and speedily solved by denying that the female sex would exist if this had in truth been foreknown by him. But indeed he even affirmed that the sex should exist by saying, They shall not be given in marriage, which can only apply to females, neither shall they marry, which applies to males. There shall therefore be those who are in this world accustomed to marry and be given in marriage, only they shall there make no such marriages. Chapter 18 To understand what the Apostle means when he says that we shall all come to a perfect man, we must consider the connection of the whole passage which runs thus. 
He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Behold what the perfect man is, the head and the body which is made up of all the members which in their own time shall be perfected. But new additions are daily being made to this body while the church is being built up, to which it is said, Ye are the body of Christ and his members. And again, for his body's sake, he says, Which is the church. And again, we being many are one head one body. It is of the edification of this body that it is here too said, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. And then that passage of which we are now speaking is added, till we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ, and so on. And he shows of what body we are to understand this to be the measure, when he says, that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. As, therefore, there is a measure of every part, so there is a measure of the fullness of the whole body, which is made up of all its parts, and it is of this measure, it is said, to the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ. This fullness he spoke of also in the place where he says of Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. But even if this should be referred to the form in which each one shall rise, what should hinder us from applying to the woman what is expressly said of the man, understanding both sexes to be included under the general term man? For certainly in the saying, Blessed is he who feareth the Lord, women also who fear the Lord are included. Chapter 19 What am I to say now about the hair and nails? Once it is understood that no part of the body shall so perish as to produce deformity in the body, it is at the same time understood that such things as would have produced a deformity by their excessive proportions shall be added to the total bulk of the body, not to parts in which the beauty of the proportion would thus be marred. Just as if, after making a vessel of clay, one wished to make it over again of the same clay, it would not be necessary that the same portion of the clay which had formed the handle should again form the new handle, or that what had formed the bottom should again do so, but only that the whole clay should go to make up the whole new vessel, and that no part of it should be left unused." Wherefore, if the hair that has been cropped and the nails that have been cut would cause a deformity were they to be restored to their places, they shall not be restored. 
and yet no one will lose these parts at the resurrection, for they shall be changed into the same flesh, their substance being so altered as to preserve the proportion of the various parts of the body. However, what our Lord said, Not a hair of your head shall perish, might more suitably be interpreted of the number, and not of the length of the hairs, as he elsewhere says, The hairs of your head are all numbered. Nor would I say this, because I suppose that any part naturally belonging to the body can perish, but that whatever deformity was in it, and served to exhibit the penal condition in which we mortals are, should be restored in such a way, that while the substance is entirely preserved, the deformity shall perish. For if even a human workman, who has, for some reason, made a deformed statue, can recast it, and make it very beautiful, and this without suffering any part of the substance, but only the deformity, to be lost, if he can, for example, remove some unbecoming or disproportionate part, not by cutting off and separating this part from the whole, but by so breaking down and mixing up the whole, as to get rid of the blemish without diminishing the quantity of his material, shall we not think as highly of the Almighty Worker? Shall he not be able to remove and abolish all deformities of the human body, whether common ones, or rare and monstrous, which, though in keeping with this miserable life, are yet not to be thought of in connection with that future blessedness? And shall he not be able so to remove them, that, while the natural but unseemly blemishes are put an end to, the natural substance shall suffer no diminution? And consequently overgrown and emaciated persons need not fear that they shall be in heaven of such a figure as they would not be even in this world if they could help it. For all bodily beauty consists in the proportion of the parts together with a certain agreeableness of color. Where there is no proportion the eye is offended either because there is something wanting or too small or too large. And thus there shall be no deformity resulting from want of proportion in that state in which all that is wrong is corrected, and all that is defective supplied from resources the Creator wots of, and all that is excessive removed without destroying the integrity of the substance. And as for the pleasant color, how conspicuous shall it be, where the just shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father? This brightness we must rather believe to have been concealed from the eyes of the disciples when Christ rose, than to have been a wanting. For weak human eyesight could not bear it, and it was necessary that they should so look upon him as to be able to recognize him. For this purpose also he allowed them to touch the marks of his wounds, and also ate and drank, not because he needed nourishment, but because he could take it if he wished. Now when an object, though present, is invisible to persons who see other things which are present, as we say that that brightness was present but invisible by those who saw other things, this is called in Greek, Eurasia, and our Latin translators, for want of a better word, have rendered this cachitas, blindness, in the book of Genesis. This blindness the men of Sodom suffered when they sought the just Lot's gate, and could not find it. But if it had been blindness, that is to say, if they could see nothing, then they would not have asked for the gate by which they might enter the house, but for guides who might lead them away. But the love we bear to the blessed martyrs causes us, I know not how, to desire to see in the heavenly kingdom the marks of the wounds which they received for the name of Christ, and possibly we shall see them. For this will not be a deformity, but a mark of honor, and will add luster to their appearance, and a spiritual, if not a bodily, beauty. 
and yet we need not believe that they to whom it has been said, Not a hair of your head shall perish, shall, in the resurrection, want such of their members as they have been deprived of in their martyrdom. But if it will be seemly in that new kingdom to have some marks of these wounds still visible in that immortal flesh, the places where they have been wounded or mutilated shall retain the scars without any of the members being lost. While, therefore, it is quite true that no blemishes which the body has sustained shall appear in the resurrection, yet we are not to reckon or name these marks of virtue blemishes. End of Book 22, Chapters 10 through 19 Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org